Hello, everybody. We are back again um, and discussing one of our favourite topics. Only this time, um, we're going to really get under the bonnet of what a relocation programme looks like from the inside. What are some of the barriers that the government needs to anticipate and get ahead of? And how are they going to be able to navigate them? Now, we're, we're able to do that because we're joined by, I think, David, you're probably the man who knows the most about government relocation in the country. It's it's really it's really great, really excited to have you here. Thank you very much indeed. Now, I'll, to it. I'll let you give a bit more detail about your own background, but I know that I can definitely say you've had extensive experience in this, right? You'll talk about it a bit more. Um, Boris Johnson's about to start his own program, but there's a fairly long history. Do you mind just sharing a little bit about that background and that history with us um, before we kick off? Certainly. Um, civil service relocation is an interesting history and it is unique, really, uh, to the United Kingdom. Other countries, of course, around the world, they move people and organisations all the time and nowhere, no one does it more than in the United States. But no one has been relocating its civil service from the metropolis to other parts of the kingdom uh, so systematically and regularly as the civil service is concerned. And it all goes back to 1940, a long time ago, uh, in those dire months when we were up against uh, Nazi Germany. And you remember all those news rules of the children being evacuated from London? Well, at the same time, uh, the government was planning for a major evacuation of civil servants too. Um, in a programme which uh, Professor Peter Hennessy, the uh, uh, his historian of government, described as the Hitler reforms. Um, these were uh, the evacuation programme for the civil service. It was an expedient uh, programme carried out very quickly within a matter of months. And for that purpose, the Treasury requisition compulsory the biggest hotels they could find at uh, mainly holiday destinations places that we've shown here on the slide uh, bath harrogate blackpool southport uh, etc and um, if you go to uh, the city of bath today go to the center you come across a very large building the empire hotel that was the headquarters of the Admiralty from 1940 to the year 2000, when the hotel reverted back to the private sector and has now been converted into posh apartments and flats. If you go to Southport and walk down Trafalgar Road, you'll come to a very large red brick building, which was once the splendid Smedley Hydro Hotel uh, in Southport. Uh, in 1940, that was requisitioned by the Statistics Authority. They liked the building so much that they uh, actually bought it in the 1990s and they're still there today, which confirms the adage that there's nothing so permanent in life than a temporary civil service situation. Um, after the war, uh, those organisations didn't return to London in the main. They stayed where they were. They'd been working quite effectively and efficiently there. We had a Labour government in 1964 with Harold Wilson as Prime Minister. Now, in a previous incarnation, he had been president of the Board of Trade, and he used to say regularly that he could get his weekly trade statistics quicker from Harrogate to the cabinet than he could from uh, Whitehall itself. And he became an ardent advocate of relocation. So we had the Fleming Review in 1967. Uh, substantial relocation of over 22,000 posts uh, went mainly to the northern regions and also to Scotland. Ten years later, we had the Hardman report, a very detailed and prescriptive report, which was difficult to process. And by the time of the election in 1979, only two organisations had been identified, Manpower Services Commission and the Health and Safety Executive for relocation. And all the civil service thought that with the election of a Conservative government, the relocation programme would be cancelled. But it wasn't. So proving that uh, relocation is apolitical. It's a favour of all political parties. And so that relocation programme went ahead, just those two organisations, a fairly lacklustre programme, really. 
And then in 1989, Margaret Thatcher instituted a, a big program, 27,000 posts going out to organise places all over England, really, and some of them were very big. The uh, biggest one was the Ministry of Defence one to Abbey Wood at Bristol, managed to some 6,000 staff, ultimately. And that programme was pretty well run. It went from 1989 and finished to about 1994. Then in 1997, we had a Labour government. I remember at the time I did a presentation to Derek Foster, who was the uh, um, minister for the cabinet office at the time. And he and his officials poo pooed my presentation and said, well, relocation is a bit old hat. Uh, we're not going to do that sort of thing. So I wasn't particularly surprised when a few years later uh, we had the Lions Review. The Lions Review was uh, conducted by Sir Michael Lyons, um, former chief executive of Birmingham City Council. And a very fine report it was. It encapsulated the lessons learned from previous relocations. It systemised it, brought in new ideas. A very fine report and worth a read today. It is worth reading and, and still applicable now. But unfortunately, that report, it wasn't executed with the energy that it needed to. It didn't really have, I think the politicians lost interest in it and it sort of wavered a bit. 20,000 posts were supposed to have been relocated. Some of that, I think, was a bit smoke and mirrors. Uh, organisations were relocated to the places indicated on the chart here. But as I say, it was uh, uh, a lacklustre uh, uh, um, execution of relo relocation. And then fast forward to 2019, Boris Johnson's government and the Chancellor confirmed in his uh, budget speech last year that um, there would be 20, 22,000 civil servants relocated over this decade. And significantly, Michael Gove, in his Ditchley speech last year, said he wanted these posts to go mainly to the towns and cities rather than the big regional cities because of the levelling up agenda. And so you see that the government has already made a start here with these uh, locations, Darlington, Wolverhampton, Stoke-on-Trent and Leeds, although Leeds is a regional city, of course. <clears throat> of so course. that essentially the uh, background to it all. You may wonder and ask, with all these relocation programmes going, five so far and another one to come, how come that the civil service in London is not empty? Well, it's been a bit like the sorcerer's apprentice. The bucket keeps on filling up. New organisations, uh, new divisions are created in London and they tend to stay there. And that that really has got to be bust with this relocation program, because all the senior posts, 90 percent of the senior posts in the civil service are in London. It is a fact, too, that since 2010, the civil service in London, an oddity in the public sector has increased, whereas in the regions mm. and in the devolved countries, they've decreased. So that vicious circle has got to be cut from now on. And those senior posts have got to go out with relocation, too. Yeah, absolutely. So you referenced um, not only Boris Johnson's election in 2019 and the manifesto promise, but also the reassertion from Rishi Sunak in the budget of, I think it was March 2020, possibly 21. Um, in the past, David, you've written about this government. You've said they've been timid on civil service relocation and you've called them to be ruthless on civil service relocation. What do you think about the current programme? Well, uh the current programme, uh, it's a good programme. Uh, they've made a good start, um, but I think it's unambitious. Uh, uh, over 90,000 civil servants in the London area, uh, they don't need that number there. About two thirds of those could be relocated quite easily. I've often said from experience that the majority of the civil service could operate quite effectively on the back of the moon. They don't need to be in London and supporting ministers. There's far too many of them there and they're too expensive to have in London as well. So much more could be done in that uh, regard. And also the time scale needs to be shortened to uh, relocating 22,000 civil servants over the next decade up until, you know, uh, next nine years. 
is a very long time scale. It could be done easily within two years. A two-year program it has been done before. That's all it takes to build new offices. If indeed, new offices are required. That's the time required to get people ready for relocation so that they're comfortable with it when they transfer with their families, etc. So no, I think it could be a much more ambitious program. I regard this as a, uh, a low energy relocation program. Low energy relocation, that sounds like a, almost like a, a negative Trump nickname. Um, you sort of speak with, with huge authority here, David, and rightly so, I think, because your experience lends itself to it. Do you mind just talking us through a little bit about why yes. you've sort of come to become so knowledgeable? Yes, I had a long career in the civil service. My background really was in HR, um, which I think probably suited me quite well for the relocation programme. So my first encounter with it was uh, as relocation director for the health and safety executive moving under the hard program program to Bootle, uh, a very unpopular destination with the staff I might say it was going to be a tough call uh, we had 1300 staff to 1300 posts to be relocated not all of them relocated some were from local recruitment but the majority of those posts were inspectors the factory inspectors nuclear inspectors agriculture inspectors and so forth and they were on a one way way ticket because they either relocated or they resigned their post because there was no equivalent post to which they could be uh, redeployed uh, elsewhere in the department or indeed within the civil service as a whole. So they had to move. And it was with some trepidation that my colleagues and I approached the relocation because we felt there would be the trade unions warned us there would be mass resignations. Mm. So we organised, as organisations have had done in the past, uh, a big programme of what we called familiarisation visits. These are two day visits with an overnight stay, organised parties going up to the uh, Bootle, uh, to the Bootle area, um, programmes uh, organised in conjunction with the local authority. And we ran uh, quite a few of those and they had a dramatic impact. Um, people went up there, they could see what the housing market was like, could see what the public services were like, education, health, etc., and the other amenities available. And um, people uh, were, they changed their minds with their families going up there, and the majority of them decided to relocate. Nobody resigned, and the relocation took place. There was one fatal flaw uh, with the HSE relocation to Bootle, which I think is worth mentioning, and that is that uh, the management of HSE wanted the policy post to remain in London, the 600 posts, because they felt they were important to support ministers. And the operational post, the factory inspectors, etc., they went to Bootle. But um, this produced a twin headquarters and uh, the unhealthy development of a them and thus mentality. And this has been recorded with private sector organisations which have had split headquarters too. It doesn't really work. In the 1990s, uh, the HSE remedied this by relocating the 600 policy people to, to go with their compatriots in Bootle, and that worked out very well. Um, under the Thatcher programme, I, I was director of two relocations, the Employment Services to Sheffield, and the Department of Employment to Runcorn. Runcorn, again, was another unpopular place to go to, but uh, we again ran these series of familiarisation visits, and you start off from a low base. First of all, you ask for volunteers from the organisation, and you get a, a small percentage, maybe 5% of people mm -hmm. who want to go. And uh, they will be people who they or their spouses are returning to the home area, so you get that. But that's the starting point. And then you have to build on it with the familiarisation visit, which is all about uh, changing hearts and minds as well. And mm. it works very well. And it's worked with successive programmes um, under the Thatcher programme. Really, uh, part of that later on um, was the BBC move to Salford. Mm. BBC running on very much like civil service lines for relocation. They transferred 1,600 broadcast journalists from White City to uh, UK Media City in Salford, Keys, and uh, they won a one-way ticket too. They either had to relocate or resign, and they all relocated um, and took up 
apartments and flats in uh, the middle of uh, Piccadilly in Manchester there quite happily. Um, and then uh, following the uh, Thatcher program, we had the Lions Review. At that time, I'd uh, retired from the civil service and set up uh, this consultancy uh, uh, company. And uh, I worked with quite a few agencies, the uh, agencies and the non-departmental public bodies were the target for this relocation program. And we did about 40 business cases for the different agencies. The business cases were really um, looking at the cost benefit analysis according to the Treasury Green Book methodology and working out uh, was it cheaper to move to the new location? What was the payback going to be? That is to say, when the save the annual savings accrue to the upfront cost of the relocation, and which we found to be pretty quick between mm. 18 months and two years. So it was uh, the, 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 the business case stuff was very positive. And we also looked at the locations that they might go to, and we looked at the challenges to uh, business continuity and that sort of thing. Um, the Lions program, as I say, uh, about 20,000 posts went from that quite a few number of agencies going to places like uh, Manchester and Leeds and so forth. Um, but as I say, it didn't really have the political backing of the other programs. I would uh, really identify both the Hardman report and the Lions Review as ones which didn't have that political commitment. It needs political commitment. It needs the support of the Prime Minister of the day. Right, and, and that's that's actually um, a really a really interesting observation that you make about the support of the Prime Minister of the day. Now, if we refer back to the first slide that we had up, um, you, you know, Thatcher, Blair, Johnson, Wilson, etc., they seem to buy into this idea and, and really get it. They, they recognise the benefits. Now, if you were somebody who sort of saw this happening and, and didn't quite get it, just describe to us what, what you think the real benefits of, of relocation are. Certainly. I think we've, uh, yes, lots of benefits to relocation uh, from London. It's the distribution of jobs, indeed the wealth, from London and the southeast to the English regions and to the three devolved nations. Um, and it is an act of uh, regeneration for towns and cities, a, a real shot in the arm over a fairly short period of time. Um, there's such a thing called the multiplier effect. This was a phenomenon identified in the Lions report, which showed that where public sector jobs congregate, then private sector jobs are attracted, suppliers of goods and services to the uh, civil service, for instance. A notable example of that is the Ministry of Defence at Abbey Wood in Bristol, where they've got a super hub, uh, which was um, opened in 1994, uh, got about 6,000 staff there, and uh, they um, uh, carried out a review uh, about 10 years later and identified about 3,000 private sector jobs that had come to the area specifically to be in close proximity with the Ministry of Defence. And that is a characteristic which will happen with all these civil service relocations. So it's an important aspect of it. A further great benefit are local jobs. Uh, at least half the jobs uh, being relocated will be for local recruitment, admin support, uh, normally. And some of the junior executive posts will be for local recruitment too. That's very good news to deploy the skills and competencies at local level to bring them into the community. It's also a very efficient and cost saving thing too, because the churn of the civil service in London is tremendous. For the admin support, it's over 30%. Wow. Outside of London, it's anywhere between five and seven percent. So you can imagine the efficiency savings which will come from that. So that's another big saving. And as I said, the savings, according to the Treasury rule book, uh, you look at the cost of the relocation and then there'll be the annual savings. If there's no annual savings, then of course the relocation is not sustainable, but the annual savings will be substantial. Those savings are accrued from uh, the property cost Average property costs in London, £75 a square foot. Uh, grade A accommodation for offices outside of London, around about £20 a square foot. Big saving there. Big saving on London waiting at £4,000 per person, irrespective 
of grade. And then I mentioned the uh, employment uh, local recruitment savings too. So they make for quick paybacks, as I said, under two years. And importantly, and crucially, I think, in view of the, the comments that Dominic Cummings has made in recent uh, days and weeks, uh, it's a catalyst for the reform of the civil service. The civil service is the most unreformed part of the public sector. Its last big reform was in the middle of the 19th century, the Heathcote Trevelyan reforms, which were important, they were very good, and they've been copied by other English-speaking countries, including the United States. And they've served their purpose, but it's now time for that to be reformed. I've often said that if those two worthies, Heathcote and Trevelyan, walked down Whitehall today, they'd see that the brass plates have, named, have changed with the names on it, but they would recognise the institutions from those mid Victorian reforms. It needs to be reformed, it needs to be reformed to get out of the civil service bu bubble, to work with the other parts of the public sector, notably local government and the NHS, and with the local communities and with the private sector, which is compatible to the activities. All that needs to be done. Very important move. But um, meantime, uh, there, we've got a legacy taking place at the moment because the Cabinet Office has been pursuing another agenda. I think we've got a slide. To illustrate yeah, by all means, I'll, I'll share that now. Yeah. Um, over the last couple of years, the Cabinet Office and its agency, the Government Property Agency, have been busy setting up arrangements for super hubs at, in all the main regional cities. And that's a list of them in Scotland, in Northern Ireland, in Wales, and in the English regions. And these are going to be very big hubs indeed, between half a million to a million square feet, huge. And uh, the uh, uh, formation of these hubs will be really formed by the HMRC and its consolidation plan uh, into these hubs. But importantly, this is not about relocation from Whitehall. This is about consolidation of civil service activities in the regions. So perversely, what is happening is that these hubs will be sucking in the civil service in the sub-region, going in from the private economies into the rather more wealthy economies of the city region. And long leases have been taken out on these uh, hubs between 25 and 40 years. Well, in the light of COVID, mm. flexible working, home mm. working, the way that the economy is likely to bounce back, it seems a, a rather uh, challenging agenda for these long lease, huge super hubs. I cannot but wonder that they might end up with uh, white elephants spring mm. to mind. Um, and I was just going to say, David, I think we actually have three examples of what those super hubs might look like well yes as i said uh, the, they will suck out the jobs from the sub region so as far as hmrc is concerned here here are just three examples at uh, sunderland 300 jobs have gone to newcastle mm. in mm. bradford 3000 jobs are going to leeds the regional capital for yorkshire in south end a thousand jobs of going over to all places to get a wharf mm. uh, actually more expensive accommodation than they are in South End. And that's a process which, which has been, is being repeated throughout the country. So it seems a rather odd agenda. It seems to be against government policy of going to the towns and cities rather than to the big regional cities. Yeah. And um, as I say, I think there's going to be problems ahead there. So what I'm hearing is it, it is it's pulling any opportunity out of towns that don't often get a lot of attention and they've been presented with this brilliant opportunity only for them to go back to the to the big cities the kind of the same old same old stuff right absolutely this this is the case this is what's been happening but i think there is light at the end of the tunnel as it were uh, as i say from what michael gove said in his ditchley speech he wants mm. to go to the town and the cities and um you know um the uh, government has made a good start going to Darlington, Wolverhampton, Stoke-on-Trent. Mm. And uh, it'll be very interesting to see what progress has made from then. Will that trend be continued? I very much hope it will be, because that is clearly uh, a very important part of the levelling uh, agenda, particularly in the northern regions. Very much so. 
and get get under the bonnet of of what has to happen here because you know we can all read about it in the press we can sort of see the statistics that the ministers talk about but this is a really hard job right so so just walk us through what the civil service has to do in order to prepare for these types of moves sure sure thing well um this is the way that uh, civil service relocations up until now have been organized um mm. the government makes a political announcement that they want a relocation they specify the number of posts and they might even mention the timeline too and the first thing that departments will do they will identify uh, the blocks of work uh, within the department the divisions or the agencies there are about 400 agencies around many of them in london so mm. they obviously be prime targets they identify those blocks of work uh, for relocation and then do we get to the next stage is which is to prepare the business case each organization relocating will need its own business case running through the treasury green book methodology to identify the benefits of dispersal to identify the challenges what will disrupt uh, business continuity what locations would be best served by them relocating to gathering the evidence and so forth all that would go in the business case and ultimately will be sanctioned by the cabinet office and the treasury and then the next stage from that will be to appoint relocation directors uh, because it needs to be looked at as a project an important project so each uh, uh, designated relocation will have a relocation director appointed to it and then they go out to the staff and carry out what's called an options review exercise this is to go out to people at large and say we're going to be relocating to Stoke-on-Trent and uh, would people like to say whether or not they're interested in coming along and as I said you'll get that low percentage rise and then you'll build on it the options review will be extended to the remainder of the department may well be extended to the entire civil service in london and the southeast seeking for those volunteers who could fill those posts for relocation and they will mainly be in the managerial grades and the specialist grades the local support admin support will be recruited locally so still some of the junior executives will be too so we're looking for the managers to move carry out that options review and then the process of hearts and minds to get people to move as i say this that will be carried mainly by these two-day familiarization visits for uh, the staff and their families or indeed anybody who will influence the relocation decision and on the basis of that visit they'll be asked in the light of the visit how do you feel about relocation uh, do you want another trip to go up there or are you happy to sign up and I found that conversion rate from familiarization visits is very high indeed and you get those people willing to go through so that's the process we've had up to now it's worked well up to now I don't think even with the uh, improvements in technology, I don't think that the basic dynamics of relocation have changed over the last 80 years. So that, that's, I mean, that's the model then, then right? And, and that's quite a comprehensive and quite a thorough model. In your sort of knowledge, do you think that's what's happening within the civil service right now? Well, that's very interesting. Uh, as I said, the government has made a good start with these moves to Darlington, Wolverhampton, and Stoke and Trent, etc., uh, which is all good news. But um, I've seen nothing from the Cabinet Office or the Government Property Agency setting out the parameters of policy for relocation, what people should be looking for, what the Treasury guidance is, but the Green Book, etc., to go through the processes I've just gone through at the moment, mm. and nothing at the locations themselves to indicate. Um, that uh, people are actively looking to move at all. It all seems to be pretty laissez-faire and mm. leaving it up to individuals to make personal decisions on the basis of nothing at all, really. So it all seems to be uh, very uncoordinated, no central coordination and no project development in the departments or agencies themselves, which seems rather curious, but it's early days yet, uh, right. I would fully expect that that will change in the coming period. I very much hope it will do. Otherwise, um, the uh, programmes uh, are not likely to run very successfully. 
No, absolutely not. I mean, just to sort of recap where I, what I think you're you're saying there is, OK, it's been a good start, but there's there's lots to do and, and there seems to be lots of, of areas that aren't coordinating and not moving at a pace. And I want to ask you a question about that a little bit later on, but at, at, a, at a pace that, that you would like. Mm. Are, are there any, uh, have I got that right? And, and are there any additional thoughts that you have on the current programme? Yeah, thanks, George. No, I, I have. I, I feel very strongly about this. I've mm. had 30 years experience of relocating government departments. I've seen it from all angles. But I feel very strongly that I think there are four uh, points which um, uh, the government should be looking at very seriously. I think uh, instead of having 22,000 posts being relocated, it should be looking at 60 to 70,000. It should be a very big programme. And that will still leave plenty of civil servants in London to advise ministers on policy, etc. So I think it should be looking at a very big programme. It should be looking at an accelerated timescale. We are in an emergency mode at the moment as a country and the economy needs to be rejuvenated and uh, relocation of the civil service will be uh, a big help in, in that regard. And so the relocation should be made, made not this decade, it should be made within this parliamentary term can be done within the next two to three years. There's no reason why a very substantial number of civil servants shouldn't be relocated happily to the local authorities. But this is a big project. Any relocation project is a substantial project. It's all about you know, people being moved. It's, it's all about organisations running effectively from a new location. So it's got to be looked at very carefully and meticulously. And so it needs to be project-led. Uh, look at the success of the vaccination program by a very small project team. I can give you another previous example, which I was very much aware of at the time. In the late 1980s, Margaret Thatcher wanted agencies to operate more like uh, private sector entities. They wanted them to work on more commercial lines. And so executive agencies were set up. It was a very big change for the government that uh, services within the civil service were identified as being suitable to become ex self-standing executive agencies. So this was going to be a very big project. They appointed a permanent secretary, Sir Peter Kemp, to manage the project. He operated with a very small staff uh, in Admiralty uh, Arch, about six or seven people working for him. And But he had the prime minister's support and he wrote out to the permanent secretaries uh, the heads of departments and uh, said that he wanted business plans for executive agencies within three months. And uh, if he didn't get them, then he hinted darkly that his team would do the business plan himself and implement them at the same time. So he got the business plans in very quickly, not necessarily in three months. I think he told me it was about uh, five months in total, but he got them very quickly. Mm. And the executive agency program went ahead of pace. And by 1991, it had largely been complete, a very significant project. But he had the prime minister's support. He could have sent in monthly reports to the prime minister on progress. And that meant it gave it the momentum it wanted. So that needs to be done, it needs to be dealt as a major project, and it will then have success. And also, finally, but very importantly, they, the civil service needs to work with local government as a partner, not just as a, uh, 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 a, a very loose sort of partnership, but an integral partnership. So I see good signs coming out from the current relocation plans because in Tees Valley, um, the civil service, the treasury were working with Ben Hoochin, the mayor there. Mm. Similarly, in West Midlands, uh, the government is working with Andy Street, which has mm. produced these two local relocations to um, Darlington and to Wolverhampton. Uh, it does need to be a partnership. Don't forget the local government, they've got the knowledge, they've got the expertise, they've got the sites for the offices, all at local hand. So the civil service should get out of its bubble and work in partnership with them because the local authority has also got the local evidence it can produce. Right. It could show what it's got, the compatibility of skills, 
needed for the incoming agencies or parts of departments are being relocated. There's so much they could provide, and that needs to be a lasting part of it. And that goes back to my other point, reform of the civil service at the same time. All these things could be achieved. It's a big opportunity, and given the emergency we're in at the moment, it should be seized by open hands uh, by the likes of the Prime Minister and Michael Gove. I just want to ask you a few questions, David, if that's OK. You've, you've given um, an unbelievably detailed history about how we've got to where we are. And I think for so many who are perhaps almost used to seeing headlines in the newspaper, you've been able to get under the skin of, of what the reality of relocation is. So you used the phrase hearts and minds quite a few times. If you had to pick, what's more important, the people or the property? Oh, the people. Absolutely. People all the time. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We get those management teams. Previous relocations usually saw middle managers being relocated, uh, very few senior staff. When I relocated the health and safety executive, I managed to persuade uh, a few grade fives to relocate, but they always had uh, a ticket in their back pocket, which was they usually came up and uh, rented a flat but kept their home in London. And so they went back after three years. That wasn't a proper relocation. We need the senior staff to move up with the organisations and to cut the umbilical cord, as it were, with London. Yeah. And I don't think, I think it's pretty much impossible to have a conversation this year without mentioning COVID. Um, the whole kind of shift in working from home, this COVID landscape as we begin to unlock, but there's a lot of anxieties about how that happens. Um, do you think do you think that has helped relocation or do you think it's hindered relocation? It should help. Mm. As I say, I don't think that the uh, government property agency with its agenda for super hubs is a helpful one. This mm. is purely civil service bubbles in the localities. Mm. It should go to uh, really public service hubs, uh, which will be, I think, very much led by the local authorities with the civil service there, with elements of the NHS, even the emergency services, wider mm. public sector, and private sector bodies as well. So right. I think that's got to be the big move post-COVID, more flexible arrangements, of course. Yeah, of People course. will be working from home more, more flexible working, coming in when it uh, suits them. I, I think it's very exciting. Uh, it's going to be a new sort of office too. And I think that's the thing. They've got to be very flexible offices. How can you be flexible in a super hub? It's just going to be a big block and grade A offices. What you need is a more local hub based on the local community in the city uh, or town by the, by the local public communications, the buses and the trains. This is what people want to keep the carbon footprint down. All those things can be achieved. It's a great opportunity. So I tell you what, tell me, you know, you, you talk really passionately about this being a, a brilliant opportunity, as you've just said. Try and fast forward 10 years, say, what would your vision for the civil service across the country be? I think very much integrated with the communities. Mm. Uh, there will be national bodies. Most of the civil service are national bodies, either for England or England and Wales or for the whole of the UK, and that will determine its operations to a large extent. But it's a question of those operations, are they sympathetic to what goes on in the local locality? So mm -hmm. a maritime-based uh, agency would be working in a coastal town, of course. Yeah. And so those sort of compatibilities, I think, would run. So I would, I would think that the civil service would change very much. I think you'll have, uh, obviously, uh, policy, very senior civil servants, permanent secretaries, probably still be based in London because they are the advisors directly with ministers and you can't remove that. But they won't need the big battalions of staff to support them at all. That, that I think that yeah. um, and people won't have to be traveling up and down on the HS2 either. That would be unnecessary. A lot of that went on in the past. It was unnecessary. Um, they, those operations could be separated. Look at organisations like Companies House in Cardiff. Very successful relocation back under the Thatcher programme again. Self-standing unit with its chief executive in Cardiff. 
uh, the chief executive will come up to London occasionally to brief ministers, but mainly they will be staying in Cardiff with their staff, etc. Very successful relocation. The Met Office in Exeter, similarly. Yeah. UK hydrographic office, which I mentioned in Taunton, you know, many, many examples. I see more of that in the future, in the next decade. That's what we should be aiming to work to. Brilliant, brilliant. And I'm I'm certain that he does watch. So if Boris Johnson is watching, what would your one bit of advice be for him to make this successful? Make success, just come out and tell the civil service, I want 70,000 civil servants relocated within the next three to four years. And I want that, I want a review program completed within the next two months to show exactly how you're going to do it and where your proposals are for that relocation. Because I want to have the final say on where those bodies are relocated. And there you are. That's the authoritative yeah. bit of advice. Look, I, at the start of this, I, I thought we'd take a bit of a canter around civil service relocation, but it's proved to be much, much more than that. Um, we've spoken for goodness, sort of 45 minutes, um, and I think we've covered absolutely everything. Anybody who's got any questions about civil service relocation, David, you're going to be a very busy man because they're going to have to go to you. Um, it just leaves me to say a huge, huge thank you for answering my questions and spending a bit of time with me this afternoon. My pleasure. I'll also say just for anybody who's watching who wants to see the slide deck or wants to get in touch with us, I'll put my details and David's up at the um, at the bottom of this screen. And um, yeah, we can we can field any questions or queries. Absolutely. Thank you very much indeed, George, for uh, managing this session. Much enjoyed. It's been great. Thanks, David. Bye bye. Bye.